بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد الحمد لله today's day number two from the Dora of Hadith just before we start today and we talk about today uh, just one point regarding yesterday which I double checked so I want you to change in your notes quickly if you go to page six where we talked about the different ayat, the different, type, the different types of ayat which show the authority of the sunnah uh, we said number five and number nine were the same we said number five and number nine were the same uh, but I went back to the book and I, I double checked but we can write, we can, uh, there are actually two different ayat but they're very close in the Quran, but they're two different ayat they're both in Surah An-Nisa as for number five as for number five, then that is Surah An-Nisa, ayah number 59. Ayah number 59. So point number five says, ayat commanding, going back to the Prophet ﷺ when we differ. So the ayah, Surah An-Nisa, ayah number 59, فَإِنْ If you differ in every, anything, then go back to Allah and His Messenger. As for point number nine, ayat showing the obligation of ruling based upon what the Prophet ﷺ came with, then that is Surah An-Nisa, ayah number 65. Ayah number 65. That's the one that we mentioned yesterday. So that ayah is for point number 9. As for point number 5, then that's a different ayah. The Surah An-Nisa, ayah number 59. Now, um, as for today, Alhamdulillah, uh, you have the worksheets. Page, should say page number 11. Yesterday, section number 1 or day number 1, was regarding the is more of an introduction more of an introduction to hadith generally because we discussed the definition and the virtues and the authority and the link between the sunnah and the quran and so on from today we will start and we will do this for the next three days probably we will go through sunnah in a chronological order Meaning we'll start with the time of the Prophet wasallam, and then the time of the Sahaba, then time of the Tabi'een, and then the second century, third century, and so on. So we will move like that. Okay, so today we are talking about hadith and sunnah and the documentation, meaning the writing of hadith during the time of the Prophet wasallam and the Sahaba. That's what we will focus on today. And then tomorrow we will move on to after that and then day after, after that, inshallah. And like as we study it like that, then within each uh, day we will add other issues as well when, wherever it is uh, appropriate so if you look today topics to be covered during day day two so you can see today we are going to focus on the following topics number one the importance of studying the history of hadith because that's what we are doing now we're studying the history of the documentation of hadith so we're going to start off by talking about the importance of it and the stage of documentation of sunnah generally so we're just going to give a summary of the different stages of the writing of hadith. Just a quick summary of what we are going to basically take over the next three days. Uh, the Sahaba, the companions, and their trustworthiness. Documentation or documenting hadith during the time of the Sahaba. The scrolls of the Sahaba. General points on hadith transmission according to the Sahaba. And lastly, we will talk about Abu Huraira radiallahu anh, because there's a lot of uh, 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 quite a few points we need to mention regarding uh, Abu Hurair radiallahu anh. So that's what we are focusing on today and as you can see all of this is revolving around hadith during the time of the Prophet sallallahu and also during the time of the uh, companions radiallahu anhum. So the first point is regarding the importance of studying the history of hadith. Or you could say importance of studying the documentation of hadith. And as you can see there are six points. So we are going to answer this point by mentioning uh, six points. So the first point which shows the importance of studying the history of hadith is that it is studying the history of a hadith is a branch of studying hadith. It is a branch of studying hadith. So yesterday when we talked about the importance and the virtues of studying hadith then because this is a branch, it comes under studying hadith then all of those virtues and all of the importance that we talked about for hadith 
can also be applied for this because it comes under the topic of, of hadith. Number two, it allows you to trust the sunnah and its authenticity. It allows you to trust the sunnah and its authenticity. So when you learn about how the, the hadith and the sunnah was transmitted, then you have full certainty that you know the, the, the hadith and all of them are truly preserved. And it's not something where there's any gaps in there, but they are truly preserved. And those are hadith which are considered sahih, then they are authentic and there's no doubt in them. Uh, and and uh, those which are weak, then they are weak and so on. So you, you trust the ulama and you trust uh, what, what the scholars and the muhaddithun have done. The third is that it allows you to understand the efforts of the scholars in protecting the sunnah. It allows you to understand or appreciate the efforts of the scholars in protecting the sunnah. So when you learn about the history of how hadith was written, then you realize also how much effort and how uh, to how uh, how much effort and how much uh, how far the ulama went in preserving hadith. And we will talk about you know some incidents how some of the ulama I think we will talk about this tomorrow inshallah and how they will travel for months just for one just for one hadith sometimes just to authenticate one hadith and how they travel to author books and things uh, along them lines. So when you learn about that, then you also appreciate and you realize the status of those ulama and you appreciate uh, and you are thankful for the ulama that they were a means of our religion being uh, preserved or the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ being uh, preserved. The fourth is that you learn about the different types of books you learn about the different types of, of books. So as we are going to study throughout the different centuries, we will mention in this century there was this book and this book and this book. In this century there was this book. And as we mention the books, we will explain what, what are these books, uh, what do these books entail, what's the importance of these books, and so on. So if you come across a hadith, uh, a book which is for example, call a muwatta. What does muwatta mean? What what type of book is that? The most famous one is the one by Imam Malik, but there's also other books known as muwatta. So what does that mean? Likewise, the word sunan. What does sunan mean? Because it's not just the name of the book, but it's 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 like a, it categorizes the book. Any book which is a sunan has certain characteristics. So we'll talk about that, and we'll and, and so on with the other books. The fifth is that knowing history, knowing the history of hadith. It allows a person to refute the doubts of those who oppose hadith. It allows you to refute the doubts of those who oppose hadith. And this includes Ahlul Bid'ah. Uh, it also includes Orientalists, you know, non-Muslims who try to attack the Isnad system and so on. And lastly, it's also the, the, this uh, subject of the history of hadith, which is known in Arabic as Tadween or Sunnah. It's more of a newer science that's come, but it gathers the speech of, of the Salaf from all different books and it gathers it all into one place. So the sixth benefit is that this allows you to uh, understand and learn about the different opinions and statements and actions of the Salaf in one science. Different opinions about the hadith and which are hadith authentic, which aren't, which one should we put in the book, uh, and so on. So a anything to do with you know hadith and uh, compiling hadith and so on. Different opinions, statements uh, of of the salaf.
Um, so these are six points that highlight the importance of studying the history of hadith. Uh, if you move on to the next page, now we have this little graph where in it we will summarize quickly the different stages of the documentation of hadith. Okay, so we can split it into three stages. So the documentation or the writing of hadith, we can split it into three stages. The first stage is, was a stage of prohibition. Stage of prohibition. Meaning there was a time where it wasn't allowed for people to write down hadith. For the companions, the Prophet ﷺ prohibited them from writing hadith. And we'll talk about it inshallah. Stage number two is the stage of permission. So then they were allowed. However, when they were allowed, it was just you know, each companion writing whatever they heard. So it was all you know, separate. One companion had a, a few hadith, another companion had a few hadith. That's why the third stage, we can title it official documentation. Official documentation. And this is where officially the ulama would go and actually compile books of, of hadith. And as you can see, um, the third stage, we've split it into three as well. So the first century, you can write there, that this includes some of the scrolls of the Sahaba. Some of the scrolls of the Sahaba, which we'll talk about shortly, inshallah. And the official compilation by Imam al-Zuhri. The official compilation of hadith by Imam al-Zuhri. We will talk about we will talk about Imam Zuhri tomorrow, inshallah. First century? This is the first century. Okay. This is right at the end of the first century. And then the second century uh, was now a few books, a few more books after Imam Zuhri started to appear. So there were some books like uh, Muwatta. So Muwatta, that book became apparent in the second century. Also books known as Jawami' Jawami' they came in the second century and also books known as Musannaf or Musannafat Musannafat these are just, you know, three we'll, we'll, right now we're just summarizing what we're going to take in the next three days okay so if you don't understand what these words are don't worry we will, we will take them inshallah so the second century more books such as Muwatta' or Muwatta'at the plural and Jawami' and Musannafat Musannafat And then in the 3rd century uh, more books came such as uh, the, the books of Sahih Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim and so on Sahih and uh, Sunan the books of the Sunan uh, books known as Mustakhrajat Mustakhrajat And others, and others, Sahih, Sunan, and Mustakhrajat. And this was, this is known as the golden, the third century was known as the golden century. This is where, uh, you know, the more famous books of hadith that you know, such as Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawit, al they were all in uh, this century. No. And the words cruel, I'm not sure what it is. Sure. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll talk about it, we'll, we'll, I'll, we'll get to that, inshallah. So any, if you don't understand anything in this graph, don't worry, we will go through uh, everything in this graph. So stage one and stage two, and a little bit of stage three, is all in the first century. Stage one and stage two we will talk about today. Okay? And in regards to the scrolls of the Sahaba, we will talk about that today as well. As for Imam Zuhri, and in the second century, that we will take uh, tomorrow, inshallah. And in the third century would be the day after, inshallah. Um, but this is how we can summarize what we will take. Now on page 13, because we are talking about the time of the Prophet and the time of the companions, it's uh, important to start off with a small introduction regarding the companions themselves. So, first we will start off with the definition of a Sahabi. Definition of a companion. Who is a companion? What is considered a companion? Linguistically, Sohba uh, It means to Just to accompany somebody To accompany 
uh, somebody or someone without a time limit. So there's no time limit, meaning if you're with somebody for a short period of time, or if you're with somebody for a long period of time, then that all comes under the Arabic word Suhbah. So linguistically, Sahabi means um, to somebody who accompanied somebody without any time limit. Now, and as for the technical meaning, and this is the one that we want to focus on, anybody know the definition? Ulama have mentioned, who is a companion? Good. Anybody who met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, anybody who met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whilst believing in him, whilst having Iman in him and died upon that state he died as a Muslim and died upon that state so this is the definition of Ahl Sunnah regarding who is a companion so anybody who met the Prophet Sallallahu and whilst believing in him, meaning if somebody had met the Prophet ﷺ whilst he was a disbeliever, and then the Prophet ﷺ passed away and he accepted Islam later, is he considered a companion? He's not considered a companion because yes, he met the Prophet, but when he met the Prophet ﷺ, he wasn't a Muslim at that time. He accepted Islam later, and that happened to a few, uh, a few people. They met the Prophet ﷺ, and at the time they, didn't, they, they, they did not accept Islam, but later on, after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, they accepted Islam. So those people are not known as uh, companions. A companion is anybody who met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, whilst believing in him, whilst being a Muslim, and died upon Islam. And if you notice, we use the word whoever met, and we didn't say whoever, whoever saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the reason for that is, maybe, maybe a Sahabi is blind. So we don't say anybody who saw the Prophet, because if you say that, then if somebody who was blind, then they wouldn't, f they wouldn't f uh, fill, uh, fit this uh, definition. So uh, that wouldn't be correct to say. And there were some companions, even Umi uh, Makhtoum and others, they were, they were, they were blind. Um, so it's better to say anybody who met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And as you, as you can see, we didn't put any time limit. So we didn't say whoever met the Prophet Sallallahu for a long time or anybody who accompanied the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for a long time. There are some people of Ahl al-Bid'ah, they, they add this in, they say they have to have been with the Prophet ﷺ for this many days or this many years or wherever it may be. And they, they make it a condition that they have to have accompanied the Prophet ﷺ for a long time. However, Ahl al-Sunnah wal Jama'ah, they don't have that clause, they don't have that restriction. Rather, anybody who met the Prophet ﷺ, even if it's for a short while and he believed in the Prophet ﷺ while we meeting him and he died upon Islam, then he is considered a he is considered a, uh, a companion. Um, Ibn Kathir, or before Ibn Kathir, uh, Imam al-Bukhari, Imam al-Bukhari, uh, he said, whoever accompanied or saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi considered from his companions. Anybody who accompanied or saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is considered from his companions. Imam al-Bukhari. Imam al-Bukhari. Anybody or whoever, anybody who accompanied or saw the Prophet وسلم, is considered from his companions. And uh, Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, so the one who wrote Tafsir Ibn Kathir, he said regarding a companion is anybody who saw the Prophet. وسلم, now he used the word seeing, but like we said, it's better to say anybody who met the Prophet. وسلم, but he said anybody who saw the Prophet وسلم, in a state of Islam, meaning as a Muslim. In, in the state of Islam, even if the accompanying was not long. So even if the time that he spent with the Prophet it wasn't long. And even if there was no narrating, and even if there was no narrating, meaning if you just met the Prophet and he didn't even narrate one hadith, it doesn't matter, he's still considered a companion. And then he, he says, this is the majority, uh, or this is the opinion of the majority of the scholars from the Salaf and those who came after them. This is the opinion of the majority of the scholars from the Salaf 
and those who came after them. I'll, I'll repeat what Imam Ibn Kathir said. He said, anybody who saw the Prophet Sallallahu in state of Islam, even if the accompanying was not long, and even if there was no narrating, this is the opinion of the majority of the ulama from the Salaf, and those who came after them. So now I've just given you two uh, quotes, one from Imam Bukhari, one from Ibn Kathir, and you can see uh, that this definition that we gave earlier of what is a companion is the opinion of the Salaf. So we've not come with something new. So anybody who comes with other stipulations that, for example, he has to have seen the Prophet only and not met, or uh, somebody says that his accompanying has to be a long period of time, then we say that opinion goes against the opinion of the Salaf. So a, 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 a Sahabi, a companion, is anybody who saw the Prophet Sallallahu was believing in him and died uh, in that state, meaning died as a Muslim. Um, after that, in the worksheet, it says, things you should learn about, uh, about the companions. Meaning, if a person wants to learn about the companions, what are the different things that we should learn about them? And there's a number of things. And these things that I'll, I'm only going to mention a few, but these are normally studied in the books of Aqidah. They are normally studied in the books of Aqidah. And sometimes they are also mentioned in books of Mustalah al Hadith when they talk about uh, who is a companion and the trustworthiness of a companion. So, some of the things that we learn about the companions is that a person should learn about the virtues of the companions. The virtues of the companions. Another thing a person should learn are the rights of the companions. Rights meaning, for, for, for example, from their rights is that we, we love them. That's the right of the companion. Another right of the companions is that we do not speak about them except with good. And another right of the companions is that whenever we hear their name, we should say, Radiallahu anhum. We make dua for them that, oh Allah, be pleased with them and others. So all of these are examples of rights. So we should also learn about the rights of the companions. And also we should learn about the biography of the companions as well. We should learn about their lives, we should learn about who they are, what they did. When we mention Abu Bakr or Umar or Uthman, okay, who are these people? What do we know? Apart from the fact that we may only know that Abu Bakr and Umar accompanied the Prophet and these, these four, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali were the Khulafa after. Apart from that, what else do we know about these companions? And the reality is we know very little. Okay, and other than these four, these four may be the more famous. What about the other companions? How much do we know about them? And many of us name our children, and even ourselves, we have names after the companions. Yamani ibn Hazayfa, Hazayfa ibn Yaman, his companion. And I'm sure many of you also have names like that as well. So, even for children, when, when you teach children, what is the, uh, or you teach them about the companion who they are named after, so that even them, th that instills love for that companion and they know that, okay, my name is after this great companion and my name is after this companion who did, who did this, this and that and so on. So learning about the companions and also extracting benefits and lessons from their lives. Also extracting benefits and lessons from their lives. So learning about their biographies is also something uh, very uh, important. Imam Malik, he said, Imam Malik said, the Salaf used to teach their children the Salaf used to teach their children the love of Abu Bakr and Umar, the love of Abu Bakr and Umar, just as they would teach a surah from the Quran. Just as they would teach a surah from the Quran. So Imam Malik said, the Salaf used to teach their children the love of Abu Bakr and Umar, just as they would teach. Uh, now they would teach their children the love of Abu Bakr and Umar, just as they would teach them a surah from the Quran. So just as you know, one of us might turn around to our children and say, learn this surah, recite surah al-Nas, recite surah al-Falaq, recite surah al-Ikhlas and so on. Likewise, they would teach them about Abu Bakr and Umar and who they were, the virtues and the things that they had done. Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, Zayyinu majalisakum bi dhikri Umar. Beautify your gatherings by mentioning Umar radiallahu Beautify your gatherings by mentioning Umar radiallahu anha. And regarding the Aqeed of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, regarding the companions, there's one statement by Imam al Tahawi. Imam al Tahawi, who wrote a book called Aqeed al Tahawiyya, in that he has a statement, very short, which is seven words, 
just just seven words, but it really, you know, summarizes what the belief of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah is regarding uh, regarding the Sahaba. So Imam al tahawi he says, وَحُبُّهُمْ دِينٌ وَإِيمَانٌ وَإِحْسَانٌ And loving them, i.e. loving the companions, it is deen, it is the religion. وَإِيمَان And it is belief. وَإِحْسَانٌ And it is excellence. وَبُغْضُهُمْ And hating the companions. Kufrun wa nifaqun wa tughyan. It is kufr, it is disbelief. I'll repeat it at the end of the day. It is disbelief, wa nifaq, hypocrisy, wa tughyan, and transgression. And transgression. So Imam al Tahawi he says, wa hubbuhum, and loving the companions, deenun wa imanun wa ihsan. It is the religion, belief, and excellence. Wa bughduhum, and hating the companions is disbelief, hypocrisy, and transgression. Loving the companions is the religion, belief, and excellence, and hating them is uh, disbelief, hypocrisy, and transgression. So, subhanAllah, just this one statement kind of is somewhere it shows the importance that we should love the companions, we should learn about the companions and what high status this has in the religion. And if a person turns away from the companions and he turns away from uh, loving the companions and giving them their rights, then he falls under being kufr. It can be disbelief, uh, hypocrisy, and transgressing against Allah and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then the next section you have is some of their virtues. So we mentioned one of the things that we should learn about the companions is learning about their virtues. And this in of itself is a whole, is, it, it can easily be a whole lecture. And you might have heard lectures, Fadail al-Sahaba, the virtues of the companions. So what I'll do is just mention maybe one ayah, one hadith, and one athar. Athar means uh, a statement from the Salaf, so either the companions or uh, the tabi'een and so on. We'll just mention one and, uh, and, and then we will uh, move on inshallah. So in terms of the ayah, uh, in terms of an ayah from the Quran, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah At-Tawbah, ayah number 100. Surah Tawbah, ayah number 100. Allah says, وَالسَّابِقُونَ الْأَوَّلُونَ مِنَ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنصَارِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the the first forerunners to accept Islam from the Muhajireen, those that are Hijrah from Mecca to Medina, and the Ansar, so those who helped the Prophet ﷺ in Medina, i.e. the companions, so Allah is talking about the companions here, وَالَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُمْ بِإِحْسَانِ And also those who follow the companions in goodness, meaning anybody who follows uh, in the footsteps of the companions, he follows the Quran and Sunnah upon the understanding of the companions, then there's a reward for those people. And that reward is Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with Allah. And Allah has prepared for them gardens where within these gardens there are rivers which are flowing. And they will remain there forever. وَذَٰلِكَ الْفَوْزُ الْعَظِيمُ And that is the great success. So that's, that's just one ayah showing that the companions, Allah is pleased with them. And not only that, Allah has prepared Jannah for them. But one reason I also mention this ayah is that there's, it's not limited to just reward, it's not limited just to the companions, but it's also extend to those who also follow the companions. So that shows the importance of us, we stick to the Qur'an, and we stick to the Sunnah, we talked about the importance of the authority of the Sunnah yesterday. And we also stick to what the companions radiallahu anhum, uh, their understanding of the religion and their methodology and their actions. So that's why you'll find many times people would say, if we follow the Quran and Sunnah upon the understanding of the Salaf, that's what this is uh, referring to. As for hadith, then one hadith is in Sahih Muslim. 
Hadith number 2540. Hadith number 2540. The Prophet ﷺ said, La tasubu ashabi. Fawal lazi law anna ahadakum anfaqa mitha uhudin zahaba. Ma qabila mudda ahadihim wala nusifa. The Prophet Sallallahu said, do not curse my companions. And this hadith, if you uh, go into the context of the hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu actually said this hadith to another companion who spoke about another companion who was higher in rank. So the Prophet Sallallahu said, he said this to him. This hadith that he's saying, he said it to him. So if this is applied, the Prophet Sallallahu said this to a companion, and then it's more befitting, you know, we should ponder of, of how it applies to us. So the Prophet Sallallahu he, he says, لا تسبوا أصحابي Do not curse my companions فوالذي نفسي بيده For verily by the one in whose hand is my life meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the one in whose hand is my life i.e. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala In other words the Prophet is saying والله by Allah I swear by Allah that's, that's the meaning لو أن أحدكم أنفق مثل أحد ذهب If one of you would have spent as much gold as a mountain of Uhud. Meaning, you give that much sadaqa, that much charity, that it was equivalent to the mountain of Uhud, which is a really big mountain in Medina. So imagine the size of Mount Uhud, full of gold. Even if you were to give that much in charity, ما بلغ مد أحدهم ولا نصيفة It would not reach even a, hands, uh, a handful amount of charity given by one of the companions, not even half a handful. Meaning, the actions that these companions have done, there's no way, even if you had spent all the money on this earth, you wouldn't, become, you wouldn't get close to the reward that the companions got for their actions. So this shows that the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, they... Um, the sacrifices that they did with the sincerity that they had and the struggles they went through nobody can, can match it and for that reason their reward is much greater than those who came after them and that shows that the best of people after the prophets are the companions of the Allah that's why in another hadith in Bukhari hadith 6429 in Sahih Bukhari, hadith number 6429, the Prophet ﷺ said, nasi thumma thumma yalunahum. The best of people uh, uh, are my generation. The best of people is my generation. And then those after them, and then those after them. Uh, the best of people are the companions. And then those after them, uh, the tabi'een, the students of the companions. And then those after them, tabi'i tabi'een, the students of the of the Tabi'in. As for some Athar, then, <coughs> as, as for some Athar, then there's one statement of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. Ibn Mas'ud has a few statements actually regarding the companions, but there's this statement that he has where he's talking about the companions radiallahu anhum and He's really praising them. So he says, so Ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu who's a companion himself, he says, whoever wants to take a sunnah, then take a sunnah of those who have passed away. Then take a sunnah of those who have passed away. For verily the one who is alive, for verily the one who is alive, is not free from fitna. Is not free from fitna. So that Ibn Mas'ud he's saying this now, you know, after the death of the Prophet so after some time has gone, and many of the other companions have passed away. So he's saying, if you want to follow the path of anybody, follow the path of the Sahaba, the ones who have passed away. And don't follow the people who are alive. Because somebody who's alive, shaitan can still come to him. He can still make mistakes. He can still be misguided. So don't attach yourself to people who are alive. But attach yourself to those who have passed away. Attach yourself to the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. And then he continues, and he, he now he mentions who is he referring to? Those who have passed away. He says, 
they are the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They are the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. By Allah, by Allah, they were the best of this nation. They were the best of this nation. And they had and they had the most righteous hearts and the deepest of knowledge. And the deepest of knowledge, and the least amount, and the least amount of burdening, and the least amount of burdening. Meaning, they weren't, you know, really strict and made things hard for them. So for themselves, they were very easy going. They were very easy going. He, uh, he said, they are the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. By Allah, they were the best. Of and had the most righteous hearts and the deepest of knowledge and the least amount of burdening. I mean, they wouldn't burden themselves. They were very you know, easy going. They never you know, made things hard for themselves. They, rather, they took the easy path, like the Prophet ﷺ. In a hadith, uh, I believe Aisha al she said that the Prophet ﷺ would never, uh, he would never have two options except that he took the easy option. So likewise the companions, likewise the companions. Okay, carries on to say, they were a nation they were a nation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose for the companionship of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam they were a nation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose for the companionship of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to establish the religion Meaning, they weren't random people, but they were people chosen by Allah to accompany the Prophet ﷺ. And they were chosen by Allah to establish the religion and to spread the religion. Okay, he carries on to say, So know their virtues. So know their virtues. And follow them, and follow them. I'll repeat the whole thing at the end as well, okay? So if you got anything missed out, I'll repeat it at the end. And follow them in their footsteps. And follow them in their footsteps. And cling on, and cling on to what you are able to, to what you are able to, from their religion and manners. From their religion and manners. Verily, they were upon the straight guidance. Verily, they were upon the straight. Uh, they were upon the straight guidance. No, okay. That, that was his statement. I'll repeat it again. So Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu said, "Whoever wants to t wants to take a sunnah." Now here, what's the meaning of sunnah here? Guide. So, which meaning is it? The meaning according to the fuqaha, uh, according to the scholars of hadith or scholars of fiqh, or scholars of scholars of hadith, aqidah, muhaddisun. Any other answer? So you said, what did you say? Of aqidah. Mm. No, this is the linguistic meaning. This is the linguistic meaning. It's not. What, what's the linguistic meaning? Link. Path or methodology. So anybody wants to take a path or a methodology, and it could be aqidah because anything that the companions, the sah the Prophet uh, and it's not mentioned in the Quran, and the Prophet didn't do, and nor did the Sahaba do, then that would be bid'ah. But it's more referring to uh, the linguistic meaning. Because Arik man kana yastan fal yastun bi sunnat and so on. So he's referring to the linguistic meaning here. Okay. Whoever wants to take a sunnah, then take the sunnah 
uh, of those who have passed away, away for verily the, the one who is alive is not free from fitna. They are the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. By Allah, they were the best of this nation and had the most righteous hearts and the deepest of knowledge and the least amount of burdening. A nation that Allah chose for the companionship of the Prophet ﷺ and to establish the religion. So know their virtues and follow them in their footsteps and cling on to what you are able to from their religion and manners verily they were upon the straight guidance okay so this was a statement of Ibn Mas'ud and as you can see there's you know each sentence come you can break it down and you can ponder upon each sentence and all of this shows the importance of studying about the uh, Sahaba anhum and there are many other aqwal but like I mentioned the, this lecture is not the virtues of the companion so we will suffice with just the one ayah I think the hadith you mentioned two hadith and one one athar and athar means a statement of uh, of the salaf oh it's time for that I didn't realize our oh, class will stop here inshallah and we will continue uh, from here after salah subhanakallah alhamdulillah alhamdulillah Loving them is from Iman. follow the understanding of the Salaf. Why do we follow the understanding of the four points? The first is that the revelation was speaking directly to them. The revelation was speaking directly to them. So whenever we have the ayat, the first people that it is addressing are the companions. عنهم. And then, so firstly, primarily, it is addressing them. And then later on after that, the, um, the address, it extends to the rest of the ummah. But initially, is regarding the uh, com uh, is regarding the companions and that's why many of many a time many ayat they were revealed after maybe companions asked the question and so on that's why the second answer the second answer is that they lived during the light uh, during the time of revelation the companions عنهم, they lived during the time of revelation meaning any time they had a question and they asked the Prophet ﷺ, either the Prophet ﷺ would give a direct answer to that question, or an ayah would, reveal, would be revealed as an answer to that question. Or if they had done something, or an incident took place, then ayat would come down, addressing that incident, or correcting their mistakes, and so on. And that is not the case for those after them. So if anybody after them, for example us, if something happened, an incident took place, or we had a certain question, an ayah wouldn't come down, a hadith would not be said. For us, we have to go back to what has already been narrated. But for the companions, if anything happened, because they lived during the time of revelation, an ayah could come down, or the Prophet ﷺ could directly address that issue. The third is that 
the revelation was revealed in the language the revelation was revealed in the language and the sahaba عنهم, at the time they were the most proficient when it came to the arabic language and that's why the challenge of the quran is to bring a book like the quran and this is because the Quraysh they used to boast about how eloquent they were in the arabic language so because that was the thing where they excelled in the challenge of the quran came challenging the thing that they were the best in and even then they couldn't bring anything similar to the quran which shows the magnificence and the miraculous nature of the quran so the companions it, the, the Quran would, and the Sunnah was revealed in their language so they have the best understanding of what those ayat mean and what those ahadith mean and the fourth reason is that they acted upon, the, uh, acted upon that knowledge they acted upon what they learnt and that is what is known as beneficial knowledge beneficial knowledge is not just information but it is that knowledge which takes you to the truth it is that knowledge which guides you to the truth no, sorry. and that's why Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an and that's why Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an he says لَيْسَ الْعِلْمِ كَثْرَةِ الرِّوَايَةِ وَلَكِنَّ الْعِلْمِ الْخَشْيَةِ knowledge is not excessive narrations but rather knowledge is having the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala meaning that knowledge benefited them that knowledge benefited them and that's why the tabi'een would say regarding the companions they would say عَلَّمَنَا مَنْ كَانَ يُقْرِئُنَا الْقُرْآنِ that those who teaches the Quran and some of them mentioned Uthman عن, Ibn Mas'ud and some of the other companions they said that these companions told us that the way they learned the Quran was that they learned 10 ayat they learned 10 ayat and then they would not move on to the next 10 ayat until they acted upon the knowledge which was in those 10 ayat and only once they had acted upon it then they moved on to the next 10 ayat and at the end of this narration they say فَتَعَلَّمْنَا الْعِلْمَ وَالْعَمَلَ جَمِيعًا and that way we were able to learn knowledge and action together we were able to learn knowledge and action together so these are a few points which clarify why the companions had the best um, understanding and it's just important to know as well is that when we when we talk about the when we talk about the virtues of the companions and their great status we, we don't mean that they are infallible meaning they never make mistakes yeah, they're still human and they still uh, make mistakes however the, the, the goodness that had come out of them clearly outweighs any mistake that they have fallen into and even if they had made a mistake then that does not nullify uh, their station nor does it nullify their level of knowledge nor does it nullify their trustworthiness as well and that's what we want to talk about here so why, why do we talk about the companions and what was the title of this point if you go back to the title on page yeah at the top of page uh, 13 the Sahaba and their trustworthiness what do we mean by trustworthiness this is in Arabic known to uh, refer to as Adala so on page 14 at the top it says this is referring to the Sahaba's religiosity and their social decorum what does it mean by uh, what does it mean when we say the Sahaba were trustworthy it means firstly their relig religiosity meaning that the Sahaba weren't those people who ever uh, or who would do major sins nor were they those people who would continuously do or fall into minor sins and even the social decorum meaning they wouldn't do those things which people would look down upon in society and this is known as in Arabic as muru'ah so muru'ah is something 
where even if it's something permissible, because it is looked down upon, a person stays away from it. So even if it's something permissible, because it goes against uh, maybe etiquettes or by somebody doing it, it's looked down upon, a person stays away from it. And this is something that is different, depending on the time and depending on the place, it's different. So maybe something in an Arabic country, uh, is if by you doing it, it's considered something which you know, is looked down upon. But if somebody was to do it in England, for example, it may, might be something normal. Uh, likewise, something done in this century might be considered normal. And if it was done a hundred years ago, it would be looked down upon. So it, it can differ from time and place. So, for example, if we have, let's say the Imam of Masjid Nabawi, he's going to lead Salah, but instead of wearing you know, the clothes that they wear, he comes out wearing jeans and a t-shirt. You are not necessarily haram, but you know, everybody will be looking, what's he doing? Yeah? Why is he not wearing, even though it's not an obligation to wear maybe a thobe or a shimag or whatever it may be, but something which is looked down upon. So that's what this murah is talking about. So whenever we talk about adala in the science of hadith, it's referring to two things. It's referring to their relig religiosity, meaning they do not commit major sins, nor are they continuous in minor sins. And secondly, they do not go against muru'ah, which you have translated as social uh, decorum. So this is for all the narrators, not just for the companions. Any narrator, you know, for a hadith to be authentic, there's a number of, there's a number of conditions. For a hadith to be authentic, there's a number of conditions, which we're not going to go into, that is studied in the science of mustalah al-hadith. But from those conditions is that the narrator has to be adil, has to have adala. And, one, and the meaning of adala is that that narrator cannot do major sins, or be continuous upon the minor sins, nor can he fall into those actions which go against muru'ah. Meaning, even if he was maybe a pious person, but he does those actions which nullify a person's muru'ah, the muhaddithun will not accept that person's hadith. That's how strict they were. So when we are talking about the companions, what do we mean about the companions? Is that all of the companions are udul. And this is the general principle in hadith. All of the companions are udud, meaning all of the companions are trustworthy. All of the companions are uh, trustworthy. And meaning if a companion had narrated a hadith, you don't have to look into it. You don't have to look into it. Was he lying? Was he not lying? Like, that is out of the question. Like, if the companion had made, maybe made a mistake and he forgot, that, that's a separate issue. And that is looked into. But in terms of them lying, then... Uh, I believe Imam al Zahbi he even said the ulama have looked into all of the narrations of the Sahaba and not once did any muhaddith find that any of the companions had lied. So all of the companions are considered uh, trustworthy. They are considered uh, trustworthy. And I've got here uh, logically. Now, in terms of the Islamic uh, uh, proofs, then there are many. And some of them we have mentioned. So regarding some of the ayat and the hadith that we mentioned regarding their virtue, they can be applied here. So I've not really left space because any or all of the virtues of the companions can be used to prove this point. But logically, uh, I want to mention this point because there are some people who attack the Sahaba. And there are some people who attack maybe the trustworthiness of the Sahaba. Anhum. And one answer is even logically is that some people attack the Sahaba and they have different agendas. One agenda is that they attack the Sahaba not because of the Sahaba themselves, but because they want to attack the Isnad system. And they want to say that we can't trust Hadith, that's why we don't follow Hadith, because the companions, they were like this, they're not trustworthy, and this, this, that. But logic, one way, logically, we can answer this, is that the same people who narrated the Hadith or the same people that narrated the Qur'an also. The Qur'an wasn't given to the Prophet in a book and in a PDF file and saved on a computer that everyone, can, you know. It was transmitted orally and written down as well, but especially in the beginning, it was more transmitted orally. So if a person attacks the, uh, attacks the Sahaba with the intention of trying to establish that there's an issue in the Isnad system, in the Hadith, then Logically, that would mean that, that this person is saying there's also an issue in the Qur'an. Because the same people had uh, transmitted the Qur'an. And this is why Abu Zur'ah, Abu Zur'ah from the he said, Those who conveyed the Qur'an and the Sunnah were the companions. 
those who conveyed the Quran and the Sunnah were the companions. So whoever attacks them, so whoever attacks them, aims to invalidate the Quran and the Sunnah. Those who conveyed the Quran and Sunnah were the companions. So whoever attacks them, so whoever attacks them, aims to invalidate, aims to invalidate the Quran and uh, and Sunnah. Yeah. Uh, and then after it's written, note we do not believe that they were infallible, but mistakes do not take away from their trustworthiness. After investigation, scholars did not find any of them to be to be lying, as I mentioned previously. Um, the next point is now after the introduction regarding the companions and so on, we can now try to focus a bit more on the actual documentation and the writing of hadith. So we've got the title, Documentation of Hadith During the Time of the Prophet Wasallam and the Companions Radiallahu Anhum. Firstly, some introductory uh, points. Firstly, regarding the Quran, majority of the Quran and even a hadith, they were memorized orally in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu and at the time that their memory was not like our memory. Many a time the, the Sahaba would hear a hadith or lines of poetry, even long lines of poetry, just once and they would memorize the whole thing. That's how strong their memory memory was. And even if you go later, the, we have the, um, the likes of Imam al-Bukhari. We had the famous story of when he entered into Iraq and when he entered into Iraq, people knew that oh, Imam Bukhari is coming and some people wanted to test him. So, 10 people came to Imam Bukhari and they narrate, each person narrated 10 a hadith. And when we say hadith, we don't just mean the Prophet Sallallahu said actions about the intentions. We mean the whole chain of narration. Meaning I heard from my teacher, heard from this person, this person, who heard from this companion, who heard that the Prophet Sallallahu said, and then the hadith, the whole thing. So each person, each person mentioned 10 hadith and intentionally they mixed and made mistakes so they, they, they so those names that were similar they mixed the names and they wanted to see that would Imam Bukhari take these mistakes out so the first person came he mentioned the 10 with the mistakes and Imam Bukhari just stayed quiet then the second person came and he did the same Imam Bukhari stayed quiet and all 10 came and Imam Bukhari stayed quiet and the people thought he doesn't know he's not taking even one mistake out but then at the end, Imam Bukhari turned around and he said, Have you finished? And I said, Yes. And then Imam Bukhari started from the beginning of these hundred hadith. And he had memorized all hundred with the mistakes. And he said, As for this hadith, the, the, he, you said this and the mistake is this and what's correct is this. So he had memorized all of them with the mistakes and then he corrected all of them. And then we have the likes of Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah. They say that his memory was so strong when he read a book, a book's two pages, right? He would have to cover one side of the book because he had photographic memory. Meaning, if he could see both pages, he would memorize both at the same time and he would get muddled up. So he would have to cover one just so that he can focus on one and he memorizes that. So subhanAllah, these were you know, people after the companions. But likewise, the companions, they, their memory was strong. So the majority of what was narrated and so on was done by memory. However, with that being said, with that being said, it's an important point to mention that the, the whole Qur'an was documented and it was written down during the time of the Prophet The whole Qur'an was written during the time of the Prophet However, it was all separate. Meaning one companion had one or two ayat written on maybe a piece of a parchment. Another companion had written it on some leaves. Another person had written it on a different place. So it was all scattered and everywhere. But it was you know, written down. And Hafid al-Iraqi, in his uh, Thousand Line Poetry of Seerah, he mentioned that there were 40 companions, 40, 40, 40 companions who had written down the Qur'an during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu And then after the Prophet Sallallahu had passed away, <coughs> after the Prophet Sallallahu had passed away, in the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu an, there was a battle where many of the Hufad, many of those who had memorized the Qur'an had passed away. 
So Umar radiallahu an, he went to Abu Bakr and he said, you know, many of our Hufaz, they have passed away and I fear that if all of those who had memorized the Quran have passed away, we might lose knowledge of the Quran. So let us compile the Quran together so we have it in one place. And initially Abu Bakr was against the idea. He said, I'm not going to do anything that the Prophet ﷺ had not done. But then eventually he realized that this in and of itself is not an act of ibadah, but it's just a way and it's a means of us preserving the religion. So it's not some, adding something new into the religion. So, so later Abu Bakr agree, agreed uh, on this uh, matter with Umar. So the, the whole Quran was compiled together. And this was known as the first compilation of the Quran. However, it was just compiled, meaning all the ayat were put together and it wasn't really put in order. And then in the time of Uthman radiallahu an, Uthman, this is the second compilation of the Quran. And uh, there's a long story to it, but basically uh, what Uthman had done is he had now gathered the companions. He gathered Zayd radiallahu an, who, had, uh, who was with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi when he recited the whole Quran to Jibreel alayhi salam and some of the other senior companions. And they re basically reordered the Quran and they ordered it in the manner the Prophet sallallahu read it to Jibreel alayhi salam. So the way the Prophet recited it to Jibreel, the Prophet would recite the Quran to Jibreel every Ramadan and in the final year he revised it twice. So the, the, the way and the order in which the Prophet revised it with Jibreel and Zayd was, uh, was, uh, was, uh, was, uh, was present at that time. So he was made in charge. In that same order, the Quran was revealed. So the Quran that we have now, the Quran, the ordering of the ayat and the suwar, that was the action of Uthman radiallahu anh. That was the action of Uthman radiallahu anh. And there's a lot more to it, but that's, uh, you know, we're focusing more on hadith, but that was just a small background on Quran. Okay, what about, what about hadith? If you move on to hadith, what about hadith? If you remember, we said there were three stages of documentation of hadith. The first was a stage of prohibition. The second, permission, and then official documentation. I want to focus on the first two, which is uh, prohibition and then permission. Prohibition meaning not allowed to write, to write hadith, and then permission meaning it's now allowed for you to write hadith. Let's read what's written in the bottom of page 14. An apparent prohibition for writing hadith. There is a hadith in Sahih Muslim, hadith number 3004, 3004, where the Prophet ﷺ prohibits the documentation of hadith. And the hadith is written here, we'll just read the English. The Prophet ﷺ said, Do not take down, the Arabic was, Arabic was taktubu, might be a better translation might be, do not write down. Take down means write down. Do not write down anything from me. And whoever took down anything, or I wrote down anything from me, except the Quran, he should efface that. Meaning, he should erase it. He should erase it. But I have not translated the hadith, I just copied and pasted it. So that's why it's like this. But that means he should erase that and uh, he should erase that and it should be a full stop there. Uh, and narrate from me and there is no harm in it. Meaning, don't write it, but narrate it. Verbally, you can narrate it. There's no problem in that. Uh, and he who attributed anything falsely to me, uh, deliberately, where it says, and Hammam said, I think he also said deliberately, that's the narrator speaking. So I, the Prophet ﷺ said, and whoever attributed anything to me, uh, for any falsehood to me, deliberately, he should in fact find his abode in the hellfire. The point being is the beginning part of the hadith. The actual point is the beginning part of the hadith. The Prophet ﷺ said, لا تكتبوا عني. The Prophet ﷺ said, لا تكتبوا عني. Do not write down from me. So this is a clear prohibition. You're not allowed to write. This is a clear prohibition that you are not allowed to write. Let's carry on reading. Note all of the narrations of prohibiting uh, the documentation of hadith are weak except for the hadith above. Meaning, there are other narrations of the Prophet where he has prohibited the writing of hadith, but the other narrations are weak. But this hadith uh, is the, uh, one of the only hadith which are authentic because it is in Sahih Muslim. Let's carry on reading. Abu Bakr, it was, it was, it was at the time of Abu Bakr, it wasn't the same ordering that we have now. It was, it was different. It was just get everything in one place. It was just because the, the objective of the time of Abu Bakr was to just to preserve the Quran. 
So get everything, every, I'm not sure exactly what the ordering was, I don't know, uh, which surah came first or anything, but uh, it wasn't like we have it now. It was just get everything together so that we have the whole Quran together. But then what actually happened in the time of Uthman is that, you know, we have the different Qiraat, yeah? Um, so, you know, Maliki Yomini, Maliki Yomini, things like this. So, these are all things that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he recited. So, you know, similar even in English, I'm not sure how familiar you guys are, but even in England we have different accents. We have a London accent, mashallah, we've got a brother from London at the back. If you want to hear a London accent, <laughs> go to him. <laughs> yeah, mine's, I'm from Manchester, so mine's a bit different. We have a Liverpool accent, Scouse, they call it. We have a Newcastle accent, Geordie, that's what they call it. So, it's all English, but it's different accents. So, in time of Prophet likewise, the different Arabs, the different tribes, they would pronounce words differently. So, some would, would not pronounce the letter Hamza. So, they want to say Mu'minun. They would recite it, Mu'minun, for example. That's just the way they would speak. So, these different Qiraat are basically, whenever the Prophet would speak to a, pro, a certain tribe, Allah SWT brought down the ayat in the accent, if you want to call it, or the dialect of that tribe. So what happened in the time of Uthman عن, is that after Islam expanded, a lot of people were, a lot of non-Arabs were entering into Islam and people are just reciting the Quran according to what they heard. So they heard one companion recite like this, that's all they knew. So what happened is that when they heard these different recitations, they said, you're reading it wrong. I heard Ibn Mas'ud recite like this and he would say, no, 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 I heard Umar recite like this. So they're saying, what you're doing is wrong. So this caused a lot of issue. So that's one of the one of the, that's uh, one of the reasons why Uthman radhiyallahu he compiled the Quran again. So he said uh, to Zaid that write it upon lugha to Quraysh. So make the asal the way the Quraysh recite it. And another thing is that he did is that and make the order the order how you heard the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam recite it to Jibril alaihi wasallam. That's why the Quran that we have now the font is called al rasm al Uthmani, al rasm al Uthmani. Rasul Uthmani is the font that we have now, but without the harakat, the fatha, kasra, dhamma, zabra, zir, yeah? Without that, without the dots, okay, that, 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 that was added in later. But at the time of Uthman, that wasn't there, okay? So you'll find that these different qira'at, the, the ulama have placed conditions, okay? So not, not every qira'at is accepted. There's certain ones which are accepted. And there's three main conditions. One of them is that it has to follow the Rasul Uthman. So for example, if you look at how Malik Yomidin is written in the Quran, it's not written Meem Alif, Lam Kaf. It's written Meem Lam. Why? So that on top of the Meem, you can put a standing Fatha, yeah, Alif Saghira or Karazabar in Urdu, we call it. So you can recite Maliki, or you can put a Fatha and you can put Maliki. Okay? If you had put an Alif, if Uthman had written it with an Alif, then you can't recite Malik. So that, that's one of the things that Uthman had also did. So anyways, that's a different topic that's studied in Ulum al-Qur'an, which I don't want to go into. But uh, that's some of the things that Uthman uh, had done. Okay, back to this. So we just read a hadith regarding the prohibition of writing hadith. So we read the hadith, Prophet said, لا تكتبوا عني Do not write from me. Okay, on the next page, now as you can see, the quite long hadith, so I'll just summarize it. There's two hadith. If you read the first line at the top, however, there are other ahadith where the Prophet وسلم, allowed the writing of hadith. So there's other hadith for some give permission. There's long hadith here. I'll summarize it. The Prophet وسلم, said something and there was a person called Abu Shah. And Abu Shah, if you read the highlighted part at the bottom of that hadith, a person known as Abu Shah, one of the people of Yemen stood up and said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, kindly write it for me. The word kindly is put in brackets because uh, he, he actually said write it for me but it's not like a comment he's asking for permission so in terms of general meaning they would add the word kindly kindly write it for me so there, uh, there, there upon Allah's Messenger said um, said write it for Abu Shah right, that I get rid of it what did he say in Arabic uktubuli Abu Shah uktubuli Abu Shah write write it for Abu Shah so as for the word I, get rid of the word I, that's a mistake. Okay. So the point being is that the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Uktubuli Abisha, write 
for Abu Shah. So some, he said, some, call a different companion. He said, write down what I just said for this person. Okay? And likewise, you have another hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi where Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As, he said, I used to write down everything which I heard from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and I attended by writing it to memorize it. Meaning the reason I wrote it down is so that I can memorize. The Quraysh prohibited me from, from writing by saying, do you write everything that you hear from him whilst the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a human being? He speaks in anger and pleasure. So the Quraysh came to this Sahabi and they gave him a doubt. So how can you write everything? He's human. He can get angry. He can maybe say a word which he doesn't mean. He can maybe have a slip of the tongue. So why are you writing everything he says? The Quran makes sense, word of Allah. But how, how are you writing hadith? So he said, so I stopped writing and mentioned it to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he singled, he signaled with his finger to his mouth and said, <coughs> Write, by him in whose hand my soul lies, I, by Allah, only truth comes out from it. Meaning, I only speak the truth, so write it down. So now you can see that I mentioned one hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu prohibited the writing of hadith. And I mentioned two hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu permitted writing of hadith. So how do we reconcile between, uh, between one side, not allowed to write. On one other side, you're allowed to write. How do you reconcile between the two? Let's go to the next page, inshallah. Now, the ulama differ in how to exactly reconcile between them. The Khatib Baghdadi. Who is Khatib Baghdadi? Hafiz of? Of, of the East, Mashriq. And he passed away in the year? 46? 463, Ahsan, very good. Okay, and what do we say about him regarding his books? Yeah, every science of hadith, he wrote a book. So, in this topic, writing hadith, he's got a book in there as well. It's called Taqiyid al Ilm. Taqiyid al Ilm. Taqaf ya ya dal. Taqiyid al Ilm. Which I, th I, do, I think it is translated into English. I'm not sure what it is, but it should be something along the lines of documentation of hadith or capturing hadith, maybe capturing hadith, something like that. Bakhatib al Baghdadi. So, he's got a book on that if anybody wants more information. You can read that whole book under. But inshallah, we will summarize what the ulama have said. And the scholars have three ways to look at these narrations. Meaning, they have uh, three opinions of the ulama of how to uh, deal with these, with these uh, narrations. And the order of how strong they are is in the order that I've written them. So the strongest opinion, inshallah, is the first. Then the second. And the weakest is the, is the third. So the first way the ulama look at it is this hadith is abrogated and only applied in the stage of prohibition. Abrogation in Arabic is known as naskh, nun sin khaf, uh, nun sin kha. And naskh, abrogation, basically means you have a ruling and then a new ruling comes and it overrules the previous ruling. You have a ruling, a new ruling comes and it uh, overrules the previous ruling. And there are many examples of this. In the beginning, for example, in the beginning of Islam, the Prophet Sallallahu used to pray towards Masjid Al-Aqsa. That was abrogated and now we face the Kaaba and so on. So that's one example. There's many examples in the, in the Quran and Sunnah. And if a ruling is abrogated, then we have to act upon. Whatever the new ruling is, that's what we have to Act upon. That's why we don't pray to Masjid Aqsa anymore. Uh, the Kaab. So, what they mean by this point is that in the beginning of Islam, it was not allowed for a person to write. But then later on, the Prophet ﷺ gave permission. So that's what it means here. So the first way that the ulama look at it is that they say in the beginning of Islam, it was not allowed. But then later on in Islam, it was. Uh, it was allowed to do so. And this was the opinion of Imam al nawawi This is the opinion of Imam al nawawi And also Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. He mentions that this is the opinion of the majority of the scholars. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah mentions this is the opinion of the majority of the 
scholars. And some uh, the ulama then also talk about why why was it prohibited in the beginning and allowed later on. One reason one reason that the ulama mentioned is that it was so that people do not confuse the Quran with the Hadith. So in the beginning of Islam, the Muslims were very little, and the Quran that they had heard was very little at the time. So they didn't want the Quran to be confused with with Hadith. But once the people, once there were more Muslims. And once the people got used to the Quranic style, and you can tell the difference between an ayah, because obviously the ayah is speech of Allah, and a hadith, once people got used to that, the Prophet ﷺ prohibited it. So that uh, uh, permitted it. So that's one wisdom that the ulama have mentioned. Another reason some of the ulama mentioned is that in, in Mecca, obviously the Muslims were little, and many of them were poor and so on. So the parchment that they used to write on was very little. So the Prophet ﷺ prohibited writing hadith so that you could only use that parchment for Qur'an. Because if they were to write hadith as well, then you wouldn't have space for the Qur'an. So that's another reason why, uh, that's another reason some of the ulama mentioned that why it was prohibited in the beginning. Um, and, why it was, uh, and, uh, and why it was made permissible later on. The second way that the ulama look at this is they reconcile between prohibition and permission. Meaning, they look at and they don't say that one was in the beginning and one was later, they combine between the two. So they say that in certain situations it was allowed, in certain situations it wasn't. So we've got written here examples of reconcil uh, reconciliation, four examples. So these are four <coughs> different examples that the ulama give of how they can do jam' between the two types of hadith. The first is that what it means is do not write Quran and Hadith on the same page. So you're allowed to write Quran separately and Hadith separately, but don't write it on the same page, otherwise you'll get confused. And you'll think a Hadith is part of the Quran. That's, that's one opinion of the ulama, that from those who try to combine between the two. Uh, another opinion is that whilst the Quran is being revealed, so whilst this ayah has been revealed to the Prophet ﷺ and the first time you're hearing this ayah, th at that point only write down the ayah. So the second example, second way that the ulama do jama' is whilst the ayah is being revealed, at that time it is not permitted to write down hadith and only write down Quran. And obviously the reason behind that is so that you don't get confused between what is the hadith and what is the Quran. The third is that the ulama mentioned is that the prohibition is so that people do not busy themselves with hadith so much so that they forget about the Quran. It's so that people do not busy themselves with the hadith so much so that they forget about the Quran. And the fourth is that the prohibition is only for those who had strong memory. It is only for those who had strong memory as they did not need to write because their memory was so strong. But as for those who had weak memory, it was permissible for them to write. And it was written as, a, um, as like a backup, precautionary measure. Yeah, pr the prohibition is for those who had strong memory because they did not have to write. They, don't, they, they, they can just memorize it. So these are just four examples of how the ulama reconciled between the two. But to summarize, the first opinion is that it was prohibited in the beginning, and then it was abrogated, and later on permission was given to write it down. And the second opinion is that the ulama tried to reconcile between them, and then they differ in exactly how to reconcile, and we mentioned four different opinions. Sorry? The third uh, is so that people do not busy them, the, it was prohibited so that people do not busy themselves with hadith over the Quran. What it means, what it means, what it means is that people 
they just mentioned, and this, this happen, it happens to people now as well, is that all they do is hadith, 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 hadith. Okay, what does this ayah mean? They don't know anything about the Quran. So the Prophet ﷺ, he wanted to give importance to the speech of Allah, and not his own speech. He wanted, he wanted to link the people with the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not his own speech. So that if people start writing hadith, they might get busy with Prophet said this, Prophet said that, and then they forget about the Quran. So that's what it means by this point, is that the Prophet ﷺ wanted the people to focus more on the Quran than what he said. That's one opinion of, of the ulama. Um, the, third, the third way that some ulama look at it is that they say had the hadith is mawquf. Anyone know what mawquf means? It says it in brackets, but anyone know? It's a statement of a sahabi. Mawquf means it's a statement of a companion. And anyone know what it means, a statement of the Prophet ﷺ? Marfu'. Very good. So these, these are two words, study of Masala Hadith. Marfu' means the Prophet said, and Marfu' means a companion. So some ulama have looked at the hadith in Sahih Muslim and they said, actually the Prophet ﷺ didn't say this. This was a statement of, of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. A companion, a companion said it. The Prophet ﷺ didn't actually say it. And therefore, if the Prophet ﷺ didn't say it, then it's not actually a hadith and you know, it's a statement of a companion instead. So obviously, a statement of a companion is a lower level than a hadith. However, that seems to be the weakest. What seems to be the strongest is the first opinion. And like I said, that's the, uh, that's the, uh, Sheikh Lissab Ibn Taymiyyah said, that's the opinion of the majority of the ulama. Okay? And then there are some ulama who have tried to reconcile that it is makhuf, but that seems to be the, uh, the weakest. If you look just under this little chart, important note regarding ijma of documenting hadith. The hadith is which, which prohibits the writing. Only that kind of hadith. Where the, the hadith is weak, when the, the note that I mentioned? The third, third, third. The hadith is mawkuf. The, 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 the hadith of prohibition. The only, the yeah, yeah, the, the hadith of prohibition now. The hadith of prohibition. Yeah. Um, this is studied more in Mustallah hadith. So sometimes you, you, the ulama differ that, okay, is this actually a speech of the Prophet or is this a speech of the companion? And there's different reasons for this. Uh, I'll give you an example, I'll give you an example. There's hadith in Sahih Muslim. Imam Muslim, I believe he comments on it himself after narrating the hadith. Uh, if not, it might, it might be Imam Nawawi in his explanation. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Inna ummati yatuni yawm al-qiyamati wa muhajjirina min athar al-wudu. That on the day of judgment, my nation, their limbs will be illuminating and shining white due to the effects of their wudu. Because of how much wudu they do, their, those limbs will be illuminating and I will be able to recognize them due to their wudu. And then the end of the hadith, فَمَنْ إِسْتَطَاعَ مِنْكُمْ أَنْ يُطِيلَ غُرَّتَهُ فَلْيَفْعَلْ Whoever is able to increase the area of the illumination and shining, then let him do it. So Abu Huraira, what he used to do in wudu, he, he, he never used to wash till the elbow. He used to wash to his shoulder. Because he wanted more of the part of his body to be uh, shining on the Day of Judgment. However, the ulama look at this, and they look at this hadith, and then they look at all of the other narrations outside of Sahih Muslim, maybe in Abu Dawud, Tirmidhi, or whatever the, the books are, and when they look at, and then they look at the action of the Prophet Sallallahu and so on, and then they realize, they say, you know what, this ending part of the hadith, which is, فَمَنِ اسْتَطَاعَ مِنْكُمْ أَنْ يُطِيلَ غُرَّتَهُ Whoever is able to um, increase the, sh the, the area which is shining, the Prophet ﷺ didn't say that. That's Abu Hurairah actually speaking. That's a statement of, of Abu Hurairah. And what, what they said is that what might have happened is that the, the person who was listening to Abu Hurairah, he got confused. So Abu Hurairah might have spoken like this. He might have said, the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, the very my nation will come on the Day of Judgment and their limbs will be shining due to the effects of wudu. So whoever is able to, and he's carried, now he's explaining. But now the, the companion, who, the, the, the tabi'i who is listening, he's thinking, or he's carrying on with the hadith, so he's narrated it as a hadith. This is one example I'm giving you. So sometimes that can occur. So this is why, subhanAllah, if you look at hadith, the muhaddithun were very, very precise. Even something like that, that little split second break, and the misunderstanding of the tabi'i, the, 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 the muhaddithun looked into it and they knew. So sometimes, some hadith, 
uh, they do say that, say, you know, actually this, uh, the person didn't say, this is actually a statement of the companion. Uh, and there's ways of looking into it and so on. Uh, I don't want to go into it too much. This is studied in Mustalah Hadith. In a science called Mustalah, Mustalah Hadith is basically, I think I mentioned this a few times, but for those that don't know what Mustalah Hadith is, it basically means the terminologies of Hadith. So you look into all of these technical, you don't, you don't study the Hadith itself. You don't study, إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالِ بِنِيَاتِ means this, this and that. You look at Sahih, what does Sahih mean? What makes a Hadith authentic? Da'if, what makes a Hadith da'if? Mawquf, when is a Hadith mawquf? Meaning, when is it a statement of a company? When is it marfu'? Hadith, you have something called Hadith Qudsi. Hadith Qudsi is where the Prophet says, Allah said. So what's the difference between that and the Quran? And so things like that, uh, that's studied in Mustalah Hadith. So our, uh, uh, what we're focusing on here is not Mustalah Hadith, we're focusing on uh, something else. So I don't want to go into that too much. Maybe next time we'll come, inshallah, we can do a book in Mustalah Hadith and we can go through it. Uh, two, two good books for beginners. In Mustalah Hadith, I'll mention it in case anybody does want to study. The first is a small line of poetry, maybe 34 lines, you can memorize it. It's called Al Manzuma Al Bayquniya. Al Bayquniya, because the author, his name was Bayquni. Manzuma means poem, and Bayquniya meaning basically the poem by Imam Al Bayquni. So that's a very small, th only 34 lines of poetry. Um, that's the study of Mustalah Hadith. And then one a little bit higher than that is called Nukhbatu al-Fikr. Nukhbatu al-Fikr by Imam Ibn Hajar. Or Al-Hafiz Ibn Hajar. So these are two books for beginners. Uh, if, you, if you want to study both, then study in this order. Study Bayquniya first, and then Nukhbatu al-Fikr. If somebody is only able to study one, then you can go to Nukhbatu al-Fikr. As long as the teacher doesn't go into too much depth, it's understandable for, for somebody who hasn't studied Mustalah Hadith before. And maybe in the future, inshallah, we can go through on these books, inshallah. Okay, um, so back to this point. What we talked about prohibition and uh, permission and so on. So there might have been some khilaf, okay? And like we said, the strongest opinion seems to be that in the beginning it was allowed and later on it was allowed. However, there is ijma' that eventually there was permission of the Prophet to write down hadith. So that's when we read hadith, it's allowed. The, the, the tabi'een that wrote hadith, it was allowed. The muhaddithun, Bukhari, the Abu da, uh, Muslim, Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi, them, all of them writing hadith, it is permissible by ijma' by consensus of the scholars that is permissible. The only khilaf is during the time of the Prophet there was a little time period where it wasn't allowed and then it was, it was allowed. But after that, eventually, that it was, it was permissible to write down uh, hadith and this is mentioned by more than one of the muhaddithun it's mentioned by Qadi Iyad, Ibn al-Salah, Ibn al-Athir, Imam al-Zahabi, Al-Iraqi and, and many others so it's mentioned by more than one of the muhaddithun okay now we move on to uh, this, page 17 the scrolls of the Sahaba now what do we mean by scrolls? scrolls basically you know any parchment of paper, obviously they never had A4 paper like we have now, nicely printed and cut. But anything similar to paper that the Sahaba used to, to write down hadith upon. Okay, that's what uh, we are referring to as uh, scrolls. In Arabic they would refer to this as Sahifa. Sahifa. Okay, and the, the companions, some of them did have these. Uh, sahifas, they didn't have these scrolls. And this in of itself is a proof that it's permissible to write, to write hadith because the companions did so. So that shows that, that ijma, uh, it's like a proof for that ijma that the companions did. Um, the most famous were two, the most famous uh, of these were two. So I've written the two there and then I'll mention a few more, we're just going to mention them quickly. Okay, the first scroll is known as the scroll of Abdullah ibn Amr. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As. And his, no, his scroll, he gave it a name, uh, which is the truthful scroll, as sahifa as sadiqa that's what he called it, okay? Now, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Aas, he was from the younger companions, um, who passed away in the year 65 after Hijrah, passed away in the year 65 after Hijrah. And uh, he mentions in a hadith in Abu Dawood, hadith number 3646, Abu Dawood, 
3646 3646 so he mentions himself that he has this sahifa and uh, uh, he he mentioned that he would uh, where he would sleep he would put it under where he would sleep and uh, he said uh, in, in in this narration that i don't want anything in this world i do not want anything in this world apart from the truthful scroll and apart from al-wahat al-wahat was basically a piece of land that, that, that he really loved that he gave in charity the point being is that he himself he called it uh, a sahifa uh, a sadiqa and, uh, and it's actually mentioned we mentioned it before you know if you go back to page 15 at the bottom okay page 15 at the bottom in the hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said uh, I only speak the truth so write it down who, who is the one narrating the hadith? Abdullah ibn Amr al-As so that's okay so that's what it is uh, referring to that uh, he would always write down what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had said and Mujahid who, Mujahid who was a tabi'i a student of Ibn Abbas he, he, he said in a narration that he had seen it as well he said he saw the scroll um, also and likewise similar to the, the other scrolls that we will mention if somebody asks where are these hadith in these scrolls all of these hadith they have been mentioned in the bigger books that came later on so like we have Bukhari, Abu da, uh, Muslim, Abu Dawud, Tirmidhi and all of the other books of hadith uh, that came on later on these scrolls of the Sahaba the hadith which were in there they, ha, uh, they have been added and they are present in the future books. So you, you might not all, you know, necessarily find a separate book which is known as the scroll of Abdullah ibn Amr al As. So you might not necessarily find that. So if somebody says to you, okay, where are his ahadith? You say, they're present, but they've been added into the bigger books. So this is the first scroll by Abdullah ibn Amr al As. Another one is by Ali ibn Abi Talib. By Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an. Who passed away? Anyone know which year he passed away? The Khulafa Rashidun, the four, you should know when they passed away. The Prophet passed away in the year after Hijrah. In the beginning of the 11th year. 11th year. Okay, so when you say the Prophet 10 years in, in, uh, in Mecca, uh, sorry, in, in, in Medina, we mean 10 full years, and in the beginning of the 11th, he passed away. So Prophet passed away in the 11th. Abu Bakr? 13. So his reign was two years. Umar? Uh, 23, I believe. No, 23, not 25. 23. His reign was 10 years. And Uthman? 35. Uthman was 35. His was uh, 12 years. And then Ali? Not four. Well, it was four in a few months, so it ended up being in the year 40. In the year 40. So that was the time of the Khulafa al-Rashidun. Okay, person passing 11, Abu Bakr 13, 23, 35, 40. So Ali radiallahu anhu passed away in the year, uh, in the year 40. So there's a hadith which is in uh, Bukhari, a Muslim, in uh, Bukhari 3172. Bukhari 3172. And uh, Sahih Muslim 1978. Bukhari 3172. 3172. And in Muslim, 1978, 1,978. This hadith, in this hadith, in the beginning of this hadith, uh, Ali radiallahu anh basically says that I, you know, we, I don't have any book that I read except the book of Allah وَمَا فِي هَذِهِ الصحيفة, and what is in this scroll meaning the hadith that he down and then he goes on to mention some of the things which are mentioned in that scroll but the point being is that he also had written some of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ um, 3, 4, 5, 6 I'm just going to quickly mention some of the, the names of some of the other companions who had written down uh, hadith at the time uh, the third the Ibn Ubadah al-Ansari Sa'ad Ibn Ubadah al-Ansari who passed away in the year 14 after Hijrah 
14, 1, 4. Uh, number four, the scroll of Samurah ibn Jundub. Samurah ibn Jundub, who passed away in the year 60 after Hijrah. Uh, uh, 660, 660. The scroll of Abdullah ibn Abbas. Abdullah ibn Abbas passed away in the year 69. And by the way, before, you know, recently, we had, uh, we said Abdullah ibn Amr. In hadith, the, from the companions, there's something called al ubadala uh, al arba Four Abdullahs in hadith. There are four Abdullahs in hadith who were known, who were from the younger companions, who uh, lived longer than others and narrated many a hadith. Okay, one of them is not Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. I've got a homework for you tomorrow. Find out who, who are these four companions. No, no, no guessing right now. Come to me and let me know who are these four uh, Abdullahs who are known as the four Abdullahs when it comes to the hadith. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud is not part of these four. Okay, I'm mentioning this now so that nobody makes that mistake. Okay, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was a lot senior. These four were very young. Okay, Abdullah ibn Umar was very, very young. Uh, oh no, I've mentioned one, sorry. I meant, I meant Ibn Abbas. <laughs> you, you got three, well, you find the fourth one now. So, okay, Ibn Abbas, I was going to say Ibn Abbas, is Ibn Umar, okay. Uh, Ibn Abbas was only about 13 years old when the person passed away, for example, okay. And he passed away in the year, he passed away in the year 69. Meaning he lived all after the person passed away. So he narrated a lot of hadith. So there's three others, but you only have one to find now. Uh, you can let me know tomorrow, inshallah, okay. Okay, and the sixth one is the scroll of Abu uh, Bakr al-Siddiq, Abu Bakr radiallahu an. However, the reason I put this as number six uh, instead of number one, which you might think is more, makes more sense to make it number one, is because there's ikhtilaf in this. That is it authentic? Imam al-Zahabi says it's not authentic. Uh, that he, that, 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 that Sahifa is actually his. He said it's not authentic. So because of that reason, I've put it at the end. Okay, but the point is established from the previous five that I have uh, mentioned. <laughs> Okay, we have a little doubt over here. We have a little doubt over here, which is many scholars, such as Ibn Hajar, they have mentioned that the first one to document hadith was Imam al-Zuhri. So, uh, and by the way, Ibn Hajar is not the one bringing this doubt, okay? But he just has a statement, general statement, and he said, the first one to write hadith was Imam al-Zuhri. Imam al-Zuhri was from uh, the Tabi'in later on, yeah? He says the first one to write hadith was Imam al-Zuhri. Now what some of the Orientalists, or those that want to attack uh, the Sunnah, they say, look, your own scholars are saying that the first one to write hadith is Imam Zuhri. Imam Zuhri, that came a, you know, a cent he was towards the end of the first century. So you have how many decades or nearly a century where hadith wasn't written down. So how can you trust, how can you trust this? How do you answer this? An answer we've taken. That's why I've mentioned it here. We've taken the answer. He has compiled it from where? From the scrolls. So was hadith written before the time of Zuhri? Yes, yes. It was written. Okay? So that's a clear answer. See, and this is why very important. When you study, you don't study doubts first. That's not the first thing you study. You study a foundation. And once you're on the foundation, look how easy it was. I didn't answer. You guys answered the doubt yourself. Okay? So hadith was written. Hadith was written by these companions. And there were also some tabi'een who had written um, hadith. Okay, why did... It, uh, Ibn Hajar mentioned Imam al-Zuhri because we're going to talk about this in more detail tomorrow but Imam al-Zuhri he was commanded by the Khalifa at the time to gather all of the hadith from the different companions uh, from different uh, cities from Medina, Makkah and so on and gather it all into one big book so that was the first official compi documentation and compilation of, of hadith as for these they were just every single person was writing hadith himself so that's why Ibn Hajar uh, rahimahullah he said that okay so you can see, you can see how the Orientalists tried to take something, twist it, and throw doubt into the Muslims. But it can clearly be seen that, firstly, even, even if nothing was written, it's still not an issue. We already talked about some examples of how strong the memory was at the time, and how, uh, and we've not even discussed it, but how strict the Sahaba and the ulama of Hadith came 
uh, how strict they were when it came to authenticating hadith. We've not even talked about that, but that was already there. And if that wasn't there, hadith was written. Hadith was written. And thirdly, Ibn Hajar, by his, his statement, doesn't mean writing at all, but he, what he means is official, official writing. Now, that's what he means uh, by that. Like from the big books, all are from these scrolls or from the memory also? From both. From both. From both. So the books that we have now, Bukhari, Muslim, and even other books which are as famous, from both. So some are taken from the scrolls. There was one scroll, I, I, th I, I, I think it is uh, Hammam ibn Munabi, I think it was him, who was either Tabi or Tabi Tabi, Munkin Sheikh, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But he, I think most of the scrolls are companions, so he came a little bit before. Uh, Imam Bukhari, but I believe a lot of the scrolls of the companions, he had all of those hadith in his book there. And then his book uh, was added into one of the six books of hadith, and I can't remember which one. But the point being is that all of them were added into the six, you know, especially the six books of hadith and also the other books of hadith, which we will talk about tomorrow and the day uh, after, uh, inshallah. Okay, um, now we move on to the next point, which is. General points regarding hadith transmission according to the Sahaba. So these are just some points. And uh, by the way, I've summarized this a lot. You know, uh, I, I was telling one of the brothers yesterday. When I taught this last time, uh, I, it took me over 20 hours, this course. And with you, I only have 10 hours. So I'm trying to summarize and mention the most important points. So uh, under these general points of hadith transmission according to the Sahaba, we're just going to focus on two. I do realize uh, the time. So, you know, we'll try to finish as soon as we can, inshallah. Please be patient. Uh, the first point is that the companions did not narrate for the sake of narration. They did not narrate for the sake of uh, narration, but they only narrated due to uh, necessity. They only narrated due to necessity. And many of them, many of them feared making mistakes, so they didn't even narrate. Many of them feared making mistakes. So that, so in that is a lesson for us that you don't just, if you hear a hadith, okay, or if you have some knowledge, you don't speak for the sake of speaking. You, nor do you speak for the sake to show that you have knowledge. But you speak so that people can benefit with that intention. You don't want praise from the people, but you want to benefit the people and you want to reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Sahaba would narrate due to necessity because if they didn't narrate, then, you know, the knowledge. So they narrated so that not that knowledge is not lost and the people learn what is the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So for example, in Bukhari hadith number 109, uh, sorry, uh, 107, 107. It's narrated by Abdullah ibn Az-Zubair. Abdullah ibn Az-Zubair. Uh, the son of Zubair radiallahu anhu. From the promised paradise. Zubair al-Awam. He said, uh, Abdullah said, I said to my father. So I asked my father. I do not hear you, or I do not hear from you, any narration of the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu as I hear this and this companion narrating. Meaning I don't hear you narrate that many hadith. I know you know a lot, you were with the Prophet but you're not narrating as much as those other companions. So as Zubair, he replied, I was with the Prophet وسلم, and I heard the Prophet وسلم, say, Man Whoever lies about me intentionally, then let him take his seat in the hellfire. So this hadith scared him. Why? The Prophet وسلم, said, Innamal a'malu bin niyat. If I narrate a hadith and I make a mistake, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالَ بِالنِّيَاتِ So I've changed لُو to لَ. In the meaning, it doesn't really make a big difference. Okay, in, sometimes it does, in this scenario, it doesn't really make a big difference. But I have now said that the Prophet said this when he didn't say. Prophet said إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ He didn't say إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالَ The Sahaba, they feared that, oh, by us narrating, and by us saying the Prophet said this, if we make a mistake, we might fall into the hadith that we are lying about the Prophet so, and this further also um, strengthens the fact that the Sahaba, when they narrated, they narrated with certainty. 
they narrated with certainty. So they didn't, if they had doubt in anything, they didn't narrate. If they had doubt, they, they didn't narrate. Or they would mention the part in some hadith that you'll find, uh, sometimes the Sahaba, sometimes the narrator, the Prophet said this, or he said this. They will clearly mention, if they had doubt, they didn't try to show, oh look, I, I have knowledge. They clearly say uh, that either they don't know, or they would mention that, you know, I'm confused, is this or this. So this gives us further yaqeen and certainty in what the Sahaba radiallahu anhum uh, narrated. And there's other examples of the companions also. The second point which I wanted to mention is that you know we have the muhaddithun later on which we're going to talk about inshallah tomorrow uh, how they would travel and how they would test one another to make sure that they memorized and the hadith was authentic and the hadith had no mistake and so on. The first people to do this were the companions radiallahu anhum themselves. So point number two is the Sahaba's criticism of hadith narration. The Sahaba's criticism of hadith narration. So I'll, I'll just mention two uh, examples. I'll just uh, I'll mention I'll give you the reference and I'll just summarize it. The first is uh, hadith in Abu Dawood and in Tirmidhi. Uh, Abu Dawood, hadith number 2894. 2894. And in Tirmidhi, hadith number 2100. 2100 or 2100. No, no, it's different. So Abu Dawood 2894 and Tirmidhi 2100. And it's authenticated by Ibn Hajar. This is where uh, somebody, uh, a, a grandmother, a jadda, her grandmother, she came to the Prophet, she came to uh, Abu Bakr line, and she asked regarding her inheritance. That if somebody passes away, how much does a grandmother, if she's still alive, how much, how much does she get? So Abu Bakr, didn't, he didn't know the answer. So again, look at the trustworthiness of the companions. Abu Bakr, the Khalifa at the time, he said, let me ask the people, I, let me ask the other companions. Uh, and then I will let you know. So then he asked, um, he asked the companions, and Mughira ibn Shu'ba, he answered. And Mughira ibn Shu'ba, radiallahu anhu, he said, "Hadartu uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam wa I was with the Prophet sallam, and the Prophet sallam gave the grandmother one sixth. Six hundred, you, you would get one hundred. So one sixth. So the Abu Bakr said. Do you have anybody else that can testify to this so that we have full certainty, full yaqeen in this? Not, he's not doubting the companion, but what he wants, 100% uh, certainty, so there's no doubt and there's no confusion, nothing like that. So then another companion uh, known as Muhammad ibn Maslamah, he stood up and he, he said, yes, I also heard this. So then Abu Bakr then gave the answer to the, the, the grandmother. And likewise, um, there's another narration of Umar radiallahu an. So this is uh, in Muslim 2153. Sahih Muslim 2153. And Bukhari 6245. Bukhari 6245. 6245. This is where... <coughs> this is where... Uh, Abu Musa radiallahu an. Abu Musa radiallahu an, he went and he knocked on the door of uh, Umar. And, he, and Umar was busy at the time, so he knocked three times. Umar didn't answer, so he left. So Umar radiallahu an later on went to Abu Musa and he said, why did you leave? And he said that I heard the Prophet sallam say that whoever knocks and asks for permission to enter three times and he's not given any answer, then he should go back. So again, what do we learn from this? Look how the companions are acting upon the hadith of the Prophet sallam. So Umar, first time he's hearing this, okay, and him being he hears, it's 100% you know, correct, so that when he mentions it to the people, there's no mistake in that. So he said the same thing, do you have any witness for this? So then Abu Musa, he went to the other gathering of the companions and he said, I heard this from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and did any of you hear this also? And then Ubay ibn Ka'ab, he said, I also heard this. So they both went to Umar and uh, Ubay, he said, I heard this also. So then Umar accepted this hadith. So this all of this shows 
that um, all of this shows that um, the companions were very precise also when it came to narrating the uh, hadith. Um, there are some other general points regarding the Sahaba. I'll, I'll mention them quickly without mentioning any proofs. Um, another thing is that the Sahaba narrated only what the people understood. So if the Sahaba knew that the people would not understand a certain topic, they wouldn't narrate the hadith to, that, to those people. And again, there's many examples of Ali uh, and, and others. They have statements. So this is not, it's not considered high concealing knowledge because they don't conceal it from people that understand. But because it can cause maybe fitna and so on, uh, they wouldn't mention it to those people. So that shows us just because you have certain hadith and knowledge, you don't mention it to every single person. You mention it in the correct time and the correct place. Uh, other things with uh, Sahaba is that they used to write down hadith to one another. They would write down a hadith to one another. And uh, another point that you can also add is that the Sahaba also would tell the Tabi'een to write down to write down hadith. They would also tend the Tabi'een to write down um, hadith. Okay, the last thing that we want to finish on, inshallah, is regarding Abu Hurairah radiallahu anh. Is regarding Abu Hurairah radiallahu anh. Now, we've separated and we've uh, had got a separate section on, of Abu Hurairah because there's a lot of speech regarding him. Okay, we'll get to some of, you know, maybe one or two doubts regarding him. Uh, there's a quick intro regarding who Abu Hurairah was. Abu Hurairah, he became a Muslim in the seventh year after Hijrah. He became a Muslim in the seventh year after Hijrah. Uh, so he might, and he migrated to Medina in the seventh year during the battle, of, uh, the battle of Khaybar at the age of 30. He was 30 years old at the time. During the battle of Khaybar and he was 30 years old at the time. And he was from the tribe of Ad-Dawus. Ad-Dawus. And he was from the poor companions. He was from the poorer companions. So he didn't have a house and he would actually live in the masjid. He would live in the masjid. And because he was poor, he didn't have a job. What he would do is that he would spend the whole day accompanying the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, learning from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, eating with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and so on. The whole day just accompanying the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when he was not accompanying the Prophet, he was revising what he had learned. So he was revising a hadith. So either he was with the Prophet learning from him, or he was sat in the masjid by himself revising what he had learned. And, you know, he narrated the most hadith from the companions, hence he was given the title, he was given the title Hafiz al-Sahaba, the Hafiz from the Sahaba. Uh, the one who had memorized the most from the, uh, from the Sahaba. And he passed away in the year 57 after Hijrah. He passed away in the year 57 after Hijrah. And there's many times where even the Prophet wasallam acknowledged this. You remember the first uh, in the Nawaqad al-Islam, I mentioned hadith of Abu Hurairah where he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Man asa'adu nasi bi shifa'atik yawm al-qiyamati ya Rasulullah Who are those who are most deserving of your intercession on the day of judgment of Messenger of Allah When he, I summarized the hadith When he actually asked this hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu said Before giving the answer he said I knew that nobody else would ask this question apart from you or Abu Hurairah Because he knew how eager Abu Hurairah was to learn And after Prophet Sallallahu said that then he mentioned the answer Man qala la ilaha illallah khalisa min qalbi no. And not only that, uh, even the companions, even the companions acknowledged it. So when it was the janaza of Abu Hurairah radiallahu an, Ibn Umar, he mentioned, I can't remember the exact wording, but something along the lines that Abu Hurairah was most knowledgeable or had memorized the most ahadith from us. So even the Sahaba radiallahu an, they acknowledged the status of Abu Hurairah radiallahu an. Imam al-Shafi'i, he says regarding Abu Hurairah, Abu Hurairah was the person who preserved the most hadith from those narrating in his time. Meaning from the Sahaba and Tabi'een, he narrated the most. And Imam al-Zahabi, he says, we do not know of a single mistake that he made in a hadith. He narrated more than 5,000. We'll get to exactly how much, but he narrated more than 5,000 hadith and he did not make a mistake in one. SubhanAllah. Okay, um, just last two quick points. 
this, this question that we've got, this is a, a doubt, okay? There are some people who try to um, attack the hadith system again by this question, which is, if he, I, Abu Huraira, was only with the Prophet ﷺ for four years, because the Prophet ﷺ passed away in the 11th year, he accepted Islam in the 7th. So he was with the Prophet ﷺ three to four years, okay? So if he was only with the Prophet ﷺ for three to four years, then how did he narrate the most hadith? How did he narrate more hadith than Abu Bakr who was with the Prophet ﷺ from the beginning and Umar who was with the Prophet ﷺ for, you know, of over 15 years? And how did he narrate more than the other companions? You know, some, if you, that's a doubt and people will think, yeah, makes sense. This question makes sense. But we can give many answers and we can give six answers to answer uh, this question. Firstly, the quality of the time that he spent with the Prophet ﷺ. The first answer is the quality of the time that he spent with the Prophet ﷺ. Meaning, he was always with the Prophet ﷺ. Whereas other companions, they had families and they had jobs as well. Umar, in one narration, he says, I used to work. So one day I would go and listen to the Prophet and then I would come back and tell my partner what I had learned and the next day my partner would go and I would stay with the business. So, Umar, he, he had a job, that's not written in Bukhari, and so on. And not only that, the, when, we, when we say quality, then the nature of Abu Huraira was that he always wanted to learn, so he'd always ask questions, and he was always, he was always learning. So the quality of the time that he spent with the Prophet was, uh, was, was different to the other companions. The second was the quality of the time Abu Huraira spent by himself. The quality of the time Abu Hurairah spent by himself. Again, the other companions had families and they were busy. But Abu Hurairah, what did we say? When he, he, was, when he was either with the Prophet learning or he was revising by himself. Other companions didn't have that time to revise and so on. And we mentioned if the Sahaba had, you know, they didn't just narrate for the sake of narrating, they only narrated that which they were 100% uh, certain. Yeah. The third, and this is a very important point as well, is that Abu Hurairah he passed away a lot later than the other companions. So, Abu Huraira, anyone remember which year he passed away? 57. Which year did Abu Bakr pass away? 13. Which year did Umar pass away? 23. Right. There's a big difference now. Yeah? About 50 years or 40, 50 years between them. So obviously he has more time now to narrate that hadith to the next generation which the other companions did not do and you can add either to the same point or if you want you can make it a separate point I've made it the same point but you can make it a separate to make it seven is that and during that time Abu Bakr what was he busy with? he was a Khalifa he's busy with the, those who apostated and fighting them and Umar was busy conquering uh, uh, Al-Quds and other places and with the affair of the Muslims Abu Huraira he had more free time. So he was just narrating, narrating uh, a hadith. And the fourth point is that also the memory of Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira has such a very strong memory, maybe more stronger than maybe some of the other companions, which allowed him to memorize a lot more than some of the other companions. Because obviously, I know we said that the Sahaba has strong memory, but that strong memory is of different levels, and he had the, one of the most strongest uh, memories. And uh, the fifth point is, even though he narrated so many ahadith, nobody doubted that he would make a mistake. So there wasn't a doubt. Okay? So if, he, if Abu Huraira narrated something, they knew that, okay, the Prophet ﷺ said that. Okay? And uh, whereas if another companion, not doubting their trustworthiness, but maybe, you know, he might have made a mistake, so they would have to double check, like maybe some of the narrations we mentioned previously. The, and this is not taking away from the level of the other companions, but it just shows the high level of Abu Hurairah. And the last point is that it's not always, a, it's not a condition to narrate hadith that you hear it directly from the Prophet Meaning there were many hadith that he narrated, which he didn't directly hear from the Prophet, but he heard from other companions. So the Prophet had passed away, so he went to the other companions, okay, what did you hear from the Prophet and he learned from them. So now he's narrated what, what they are narrating, 
also. And like we said, he had more time to do that compared to other uh, companions. No. So that's uh, how we can answer this question. And the last point, uh, which is very quick, inshallah. No? Oh, naam. This is another point, very good as well. I can add that as well. Zakal khair, Sheikh. Is that the Prophet وسلم, also made dua for uh, the, the memory of Abu Hurairah This is, you can make it number seven now. No, I mean, in number four, this You can add it to number. You can add it to number four, but I think we should separate it because. Uh, this is a dua of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So one thing is having a good memory and another is that the Prophet is making dua for you. There's a big difference between the two points. Jazakallah <laughs> khair Okay, uh, and the last question is, uh, is more of an extra benefit. Is who are the Sahaba who narrated the most hadith? Okay, so we're going to mention the nine companions who had narrated the most hadith. Um, the first was Abu Hurairah, and, and this is mentioned by uh, Imam al Siyuti in his Al Fiyah. Imam al Siyuti has a thousand line poetry when it comes to hadith. Uh, I've taken this uh, from there. So Abu Hurairah, he narrated the most, he narrated 5374 5, hadith. 5,374 uh, hadith. And when we say hadith, we don't necessarily mean, you know, the, the ulama, do you know how they would count a hadith? They would say, for example, Imam, Imam Ahmed memorized a million hadith. Each, even if the wording of the hadith is the same, but there's a different chain of narration. So for example, I say one hadith. I heard, for example, I heard from, I'm just going to use one person. I heard from Ibn Umar that the Prophet ﷺ said such and such. But then I also heard it from Ibn Abbas. And I also heard it from Umar. Right. This is three separate hadith they would call it. So when we say 5374, we mean all of these different chains. Okay, so if you look at the actual wording of the hadith, it works out to be just over 1500 actually. So if you look at the actual, those hadith, if you make all of those that have the same wording as one, then that would be um, about 1,500 uh, hadith. And, th and that makes sense. If you were, uh, you know, and that, that helps us answer the previous question also, because that works out to be approximately him memorizing one hadith a day. So if you look at his whole life, it works out to be one hadith a day. This could be another point. This could be another point. You can add it, yeah. You can add it as another point. SubhanAllah. Look, more points are being added, huh? Okay. Um, I'm going to quickly finish the rest. So keep your pens ready, inshallah. The next is Abdullah ibn Umar. Abdullah ibn Umar, he narrated 2,630, 2,630. 2,630. And then we have Anas ibn Malik, who narrated 2,286, 2,286. And then we have Aisha, umul mu'minin. Aisha, she narrated 2,210, 2210. And in this, look, she's from the one who narrated the most hadith. And uh, so that also should be motivation for our sisters as well to also learn hadith and to narrate hadith. And in fact, her, her hadith, uh, maybe the other hadith that we've narrated for other companions, they overlap and the similar hadith. But her hadith were different because her hadith was how the Prophet was at, was at home. There's no other companion had the, you know, had the opportunity to see like her. So the knowledge we take from her, you know, maybe more than what some of the companions c combined uh, have narrated. Yeah. And that's, that's why uh, some ulama have said that she's narrated rubr sharia, a quarter of the sharia, because all those narrating to, uh, relating to family law and nikah and how to be with a wife and all of that stuff, she narrated. Whereas, Abdullah ibn Umar, Abdullah Abbas, Abu Hurairah is not going to be narrating those type of things. Okay, number five, Abdullah ibn Abbas. Abdullah ibn Abbas, he narrated 1660, 1660. Then we have Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. Uh, so, sorry, before that we have uh, uh, Jabir ibn Abdullah. Jabir ibn Abdullah. Who narrated 1540. 1540. 
four zero. Uh, then number seven, Abu Sa'id Al Khudri. Abu Sa'id Al Khudri who narrated one one seven zero. One thousand one hundred and seventy. So all of these were above a thousand. Now we're gonna get to below a thousand. Uh, number eight is Abdullah bin Mas'ud. Abdullah bin Mas'ud who narrated eight four eight. 848 hadith and lastly we have Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As who narrated 700 700 so it's one last time quickly I'm just going to say it. Abu Huraira 5374 Abdullah ibn Umar 2630 Anas ibn Malik 2286 uh, Aisha 2210 uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas 1660 Jabir Abdullah 1540, Abu Sa'id al Khudri 1170, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud 848, and lastly Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As 700. And with that, we conclude today's uh, session. Subhanakallah, alhamdulillah, ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa tawbiyah.